I want to turn tonight to the second chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the 23rd verse. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, when you hear about Christ and all the great things that he did, you may believe on him. You may believe in him. But Jesus knows your heart, and when he sees your heart, he will not commit himself to you. Now, the question I want to ask is, has Christ committed himself to you? Because your heart has been cleansed of sin. Then it goes on into the next chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. This literally in its original language means born from above. It's born anew. It's a new beginning. And I want to ask you, have you ever longed to start life over? Or like the psalmist, have you ever said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me? Have you ever thought to yourself, I'd like to start it all over again? Now, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus, had been in that crowd that Jesus would not commit himself to them. He knew their hearts, and he knew that they had never been born again. And Nicodemus was one of them, and he was a great religious leader. And he came to Jesus at night, and he wanted to ask some spiritual questions. Now, he was not only a great religious leader, but... Uh, he, he did many things that you and I don't do in his religion. And he wanted to have some more thought before committing himself. Now, searching is important. Searching for purpose and meaning in your life, for psychological and philosophical questions. But it not, does no good unless you search in the right place. And the right place is to search in the Bible, the Word of God, and come to Jesus. I heard about a 10-year-old boy that was writing a thesis, and uh, he went to his grandmother, and he was writing on birth, and he said, Grandmother, how were you born? And she said, a stork brought me. She went to his mother, and he said, Mother, how were you born? She said, a stork brought me. Then he said, well, how was I born? She said, a stork brought you. And he started his thesis this way. There hasn't been a natural birth in our family in three generations. <laughs> Now, the scripture says we have to be born again. And how do you become born again? What does that mean? Nicodemus must have been stunned. Nicodemus was a ruler. He was rich. He was religious. But he was searching for reality. Now, he fasted two days a week. He spent two hours daily in prayer. He gave 10% of all of his income to this temple. He was a professor of theology. He worked hard at religion. But Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again if you are to even see the kingdom of God. Now, why did Jesus say this? Why did he say you must be born again? Because he knew what was in the hearts of people. What causes lying, cheating, hate, prejudice, greed, injustice, selfishness, cruelty, jealousy, perversion, ultimately war? What causes it? Jesus said those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile a man. Now, psychologists and sociologists and historians realize that something's wrong with the human race. And if we don't find out what's wrong pretty soon and straighten it out, we may end up in a nuclear war that could destroy this planet. What is it? What's wrong? 
The Bible tells us. The Bible says the thing that is wrong is that we have a disease. It affects the whole human race all over the world, and the disease is called sin. Notice I said sin, singular, and from the singular, which is the disease, come all of the sins of jealousy and hate and lust and greed and all the rest, which ends up in war, war in a community, war in a family, war in your own heart, war in the world. Now, where did this sin come from? This sin came from the fact that God created you in his image. You have a body, but living down inside your body is your spirit, your soul. And that's the part of you that can have fellowship with God and did have fellowship with God. And God said that if you will obey me and serve me and live for me, we'll build this wonderful world together. But man broke God's law. Man rebelled against God. And his first child was named Cain. And Cain became jealous and killed his brother Abel. That was the beginning of all the wars of history. And that sin that was in Cain's heart that he inherited from his mother and father, Adam and Eve, has been passed from generation to generation to generation to generation down to you and me. All have sinned, the Bible says. Everybody has sinned. Billy Graham is a sinner. You are a sinner. And sin is very serious in the sight of God because the result of sin, the penalty of sin, is death. Physical death, we all know about. But it's spiritual death. You can be alive right now physically, but your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead, and you keep searching for something, and you can't find it. You don't know what it is. You can't find it in money. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in sex. You can't find it in all of these other substitutes. You'll never find what you're looking for in life till you come to the cross of Christ and are born again. So what is this business of the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a person be born when he's old? He wanted to understand it intellectually. The Bible says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. Foolishness. Idiotic. There's no way that our little finite minds can understand all there is to know about the great God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And there's no way that we can understand all that happened at the cross when the, Jesus Christ died and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible tells us that God at that moment was laying on him all of our sins, all of our hell, all of our judgment. He took it on the cross. So how do we find it? We cannot come intellectually alone. Now, there are a lot of things that I don't understand. I was watching some cows graze today out in the country. And I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter. But they do. I don't understand color television or the satellites or the computers. Now, how do you go about proving a mother's love in a laboratory? Nicodemus could see only the physical and the material, and Jesus was speaking about something spiritual. He had already been born physically, but he had not been born spiritually. You have to be born twice, physically and spiritually. Now, you can't inherit it, and it's not by works, not by works of righteousness, which we've done according to his, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You can reform yourself, but that's not it. Or you cannot imitate Christ. People say, oh, I try to imitate Christ. I live by the Sermon on the Mountain, the Golden Rule. Isn't that good enough? No, that's not good enough. We had, uh, I heard about a couple of many years ago that uh, were living in Oklahoma, and they said they were going to go to New York, and they told all their friends they were going to New York. And while in New York, they were going to go see My Fair Lady with Rex Harris. And so uh, they got to New York, but they found out it was sold four or five months in advance. But they told all their friends and they were embarrassed. So they went and stood in front of the theater wondering what they would do. And when all the people had gone in, they went up and bought one of the books. They told all about it and all the pictures in it. 
And then they saw people coming along and tearing the tickets up afterward and dropping it in the wastebasket or dropping it even on the street. They picked up some torn tickets and they went home. Now they had everything. They had the tickets, they had the program, and they could sing. I could have danced all night. Or on the street where she lives in one of the songs out of My Fair Lady. And everybody thought that they had been to see My Fair Lady. The only trouble was they hadn't. They had everything but the real thing. And that's the way many of us are. We have everything but the real thing. Ezekiel says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. The Apostle Paul sp speaks of being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it a new creation. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. In Peter, Peter says, being partakers of the divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change of heart, a change of spirit that influences our way of thinking, our way of living, our attitudes, as well as our actions. It determines our destiny. How is it accomplished? Jesus said it's a mystery. He said it's like the wind. You can see the evidences of the wind. The wind is blowing, but you can't see the wind itself. And there's the analogy of natural birth. You see, there's the moment of gestation, of, uh, pardon me, of conception. Then there's the months of gestation, then there's actual birth. And with many of you, you might have had conception or you may be in some stage of gestation, but you haven't been born yet and you need to be born. And how does that happen? The Bible tells us, first of all, there must be the reception to the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now, doesn't it sound strange and foolish to you that a man can stand up here and talk about Jesus Christ and your life can be changed by that message? Isn't that foolish? Well, that's what the Bible says about it. It's foolish. That's the reason you come by simple childlike faith, as we heard a moment ago, like a little child. Jesus said, unless you come as a little child and be converted, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then it's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, the Bible says. You cannot come to Christ unless you are made uncomfortable by the Holy Spirit and he shows you that you've sinned. You cannot come to Christ unless he draws you to the cross. And he may use a mother's prayers. He may use a tragic experience. He may use the sermon of a clergyman. Or he may use the example of some wonderful person that you know. Or maybe he'll use a little tract of some sort that somebody gives out. I remember the meeting the Surgeon General of Portugal and he told me that he was walking down the street one day and he picked up a piece of paper on his shoe and when he got to his house he took the piece of paper off and it was a little tract on how to find Christ and he said he had never read anything like that in his life and he read it and he studied it and he read it and he studied it and got him a Bible and studied some of those verses and he was born again and he became a Bible teacher. He became a wonderful proclaimer of the gospel just through the reading the word of God. It gives new life. The Bible says that we're dead in sin and you have he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Man needs new life. He needs to be born from above. What about you? Man without God is dead, and life is at best a bore, and it's soon over. And the moment you give your life to Christ, he in the wells, and I will put my spirit within you. The scripture says, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When you leave here tonight, after you've received Christ into your heart, you don't leave alone. We sang that song when we come in the Shankly Gates every night. There's that little 
inscription that says, you'll never be alone, you'll never walk alone. Christ goes with you. The Spirit of God goes with you to help you to live the Christian life. There's nobody here, including me, that can live the Christian life. I cannot live it. It's too much for me. But Christ can live it through me, and he can give me the strength to produce by the Holy Spirit love and joy and peace and long-suffering and all the fruit of the Spirit. Know you not that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, the Bible says? He gives you a new power in your life, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power to love, power to resist the temptations in life. In Wakefield, England, some time ago, I read about a woman who tried her driver's test for the 38th time and failed. And perhaps you've tried nearly that many times for a license spiritually to sit in the driver's seat of your own life. I'm asking you to move over and trust the Holy Spirit to drive and control your life. Do you know Christ? Are you sure? You see, when Christ died on the cross, he died for you. And God says, I'll forgive your sins. I'll give you eternal life. You can start life all over again, even if you're 70 years of age or 100 years old. But come while you're young. If you're a young person, you ought to run to Christ. Because you see, the Bible says, remember now thy creator on the days of thy youth. The Bible calls young people especially to come to him. What will he do for you? He'll forgive every sin you've ever committed. He'll give you eternal life. You're born into his kingdom. That means that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. Then what do you have to do? Christ died, gave his life for you. What do you do? You respond by first repentance. What does repentance mean? The word repentance means to change, to change your way, to change your mind, to change your way of living, to let Christ come and help you become a new person. And the second thing you must do is come by faith. Remember I said you cannot understand it all intellectually. You come by simple childlike faith, like a little child trusts its father or mother. And then thirdly, you must be willing to live for Christ and follow him and serve him. And I don't want to fool anybody here. I don't want to mislead anybody. And I don't want you to come under any illusions. If you come to Christ, you mean it. And say, I'm willing to let him come in and change me and make me a new person. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to take my text from my new book. It's found Joshua 24, 15. Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made a choice. Joshua voted. Now, Joshua had led the people of Israel after the death of Moses. He was a great general. And now at the end of his life, he's called all the people together at Shechem. Now Shechem was between two mountains. One was the mountain of law and the other one was another mountain. And between those two mountains, they gathered. Now the history of Israel was always up and down. For a little while they'd serve the Lord and then they would fall back in their old ways and go to their old idols. And in this case, it was Baal. And he was telling them, you've got to make a choice. It's between Baal and God. Which is it going to be? Who do you vote for? You know, we have old proverbs. I suppose you have them here in North Florida. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. 
Now, they made decisions, and they cast their votes, no matter what the cost was, because of what they believed. And Joshua said, I'm calling my family together, and we're voting for God. We're going to serve the true and the living God. Now, outwardly, the followers of God, but deep in their hearts, they were idolaters. And Joshua says that such a condition cannot continue. You must decide whether you're going to worship those idols or worship the living God. And they must decide immediately. That was Israel's day of election, Israel's day of decision. They must go on record for God or against him. And you must decide tonight. There are hundreds of people here tonight that have to decide tonight. And your decision tonight, yes or no, will decide where you'll be a hundred years from now. Because you see, only one God can occupy the throne of your heart. The Scripture says, The first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now, we have idolatry today in subtle ways. Our actors and actresses and academics many times and even athletes can very easily, subtly become our gods. Richard Phelps wrote in Time magazine in September with regard to the cocaine deaths of sports superstars, he said, the trouble is that Americans tend to think of athletes as godlike beings. And sometimes that is true. We make too much of some of the young players, and these young players sometimes just cannot take it, and they crack up because it takes experience and maturity to take all the money and all the fame so suddenly at such a young age. And Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. But regardless of what the people did, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't care if the whole outfit turns against God. I don't care if all of you turn to idolatry. My house and me, we're going to serve the true and the living God. Have you ever said that? Have you ever said, I'm going to serve Christ no matter what my peers think or what my classmates think or what the people that wor I work with think or my neighbors? Robert Browning exclaimed a hundred years ago, this business of life is made up of terrible choices. And it is. We have to make some of these choices in our lives. Adam had to make that choice. Was he going to build his world with God and have peace in the world and justice in the world? Or was he going to go his own way? He decided to go his own way and to listen to the devil. And he led the whole world astray. The rich young ruler came to Jesus wanting to find some spiritual help. And Jesus said, all right, would you like to have eternal life? Well, the rich young ruler said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, if you want eternal life, you do this and this and this and this. The rich young ruler left sadly because he couldn't pay the price, and Jesus would not bargain with him. Every person that ever lived has to make the same choice. It's either the world and its pleasures and its gods or it's Christ. Which is it for you? Now, first, we must choose two ways of life, between two ways. The prophet I, Jeremiah wrote, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Which road are you on? Jesus Christ said, I am the way. I am the way. Come to Christ. He will give you a new strength and a new power and a new joy and a new peace and a purpose for living. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, the Bible says, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It looks right, that road you're on. The path you've chosen looks right. It looks so good. That business you're in, that school you're in looks so good. But one of these days, unless you're committed to Christ and in the will of God, you'll soon find out that you're on the wrong road. Some people say, well, if I follow my conscience, isn't that enough? No, because your conscience can be dead. Many people have a dead conscience. But when you come to Jesus Christ, he resensitizes the conscience. You see, you, you, you tell a lie, 
when you're a child and your conscience bothers you. Now you can look a person straight in the face and tell a lie and it doesn't bother you at all. There was a time when you do some other things that bother you, now you can do it and it doesn't bother you. You say, well, that's not so bad then. Your conscience doesn't bother you. Why? Because your conscience has been seared or it's dead. But when you come to Christ, he gives you a new conscience so that you can be sensitive to those things that are wrong. People say, well, being sincere, if I'm sincere in life, isn't that enough? No, it's not enough. You can be sincere. My mother was very sincere one time when I was sick, and she gave me some iodine by mistake. She thought she was giving me cough medicine, but it was wrong, sincerely wrong. Or they say, well, if I, I, I do so, so many good things for people, and I smile at people, and I'm friendly with people, don't you think God understands if I commit a little sin now and again, and he'll understand. He's a good God. He's a loving God and all that. No, God doesn't understand. If you know Christ, then those sins are forgiven. But you see, we are not saved by our goodness and our own works. I've come from a country, France, where many people think that they're saved by, being, by their good works. They've been taught that since childhood as a part of religion. But you're not saved by good works. You're saved by the grace of God, for by grace are we saved through faith in that, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I was saved by my own goodness, I'd get up to heaven and walk around and brag and say, look what I did to get here. I was a good boy. But we're all sinners. None of us deserve to be in heaven. God says that we're to be as holy as he is. I can't be as holy as God. So what happens? Christ came and died on the cross and shed his blood to provide for me a holiness that I do not naturally have. And he provides a clothe, a cloth of holiness for me and righteousness that I don't deserve. Then there are people who say, well, I reformed. Yes, you can reform the rest of your life, but that's not it. You must come to Christ and you must enter the narrow gate and walk the narrow road. So there's a choice that you have. You have to vote one life or the other. Which will it be? A life of surrender to Christ as Lord and Savior or a life in which you surrender to yourself and your own desires and your own pleasures and your own lust and your own greed and your own jealousies. And then you have to make a choice between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in materialism. You have to make a choice. It's either self or Christ. Which will it be? Not only two ways of life, not only two masters, but also you have to choose between two destinies. What is your destiny? Where will you be 50, 100 years from tonight? You'll be somewhere, the real you. Your body will be in the grave perhaps, but you, the real you, your soul, your spirit, the thing that thinks and remembers and loves and so forth, that's the part of you that will live forever, either in heaven or hell, and you've got to make a choice between the two. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, used to emphasize that no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ, and he was right. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with such clarity and authority as did Jesus Christ. One of television's most popular programs during the last year has been entitled Highway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. We went to uh, Romania last year holding meetings, and, and there were thousands of people as far as you could see. And they took me into a place called Moldavia, and they took us on a little sightseeing tour up into the hills and the mountains and so forth, and they took us to churches and buildings that were painted about a thousand years ago with a kind of paint that has never lost its glow and its color, and they don't know how they did it. They think maybe they used honey, but they don't, they're not sure. 
and all the paintings are religious paintings because the people didn't have any Bibles and they didn't have any uh, Christian literature and they had no way of telling the story of the Bible. So they taught the Bible with paintings on the sides of buildings. And you can see the whole Bible story. And I saw one painting in beautiful blue and the various colors that had lasted a thousand years and I thought to myself, look at that. It was a picture of a ladder that was going from the fires of hell up to where Jesus was at the top of the ladder in paradise. And down below were demons all the way up that ladder, pulling at them, pulling at them, trying to get them into the flames. Then over them were the angels helping them along up that ladder. And I thought that's a little bit like it might be distorted. It may not be theologically exactly right, but they had the idea because there is a constant battle for your soul going on all the time. You see, your soul is important to the devil. He wants your soul. He'll pay any price. And some of you are selling your soul so cheaply. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The devil will give you the whole world if you'll follow him. But some of you will follow him and he won't give you anything. You just follow him because you don't, you're like the pig that's following the man that's dropping the beans, going to the slaughter pen. Every little bit he drops a bean and the pig goes <coughs> following right along. And you don't even think that you're following the devil in the wrong direction. Yes, Jesus Christ is the highway to heaven. But be aware, no man cometh to the Father but by me, he said. And then this choice or this vote that you make has got to be yourself. You must make that vote yourself. For as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know one, I guess one of the year's most popular songs is Madonna's Papa Don't Preach. Now Joshua didn't hesitate for one moment to preach to those people. He said, as for me and my house, he was voting for Christ, for God. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. He had to choose for himself. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within us where we retire from all of the fellowship, all of the influences. There's a lonely arena in the depths of your heart where the greatest battle of life must be fought alone. That's your decision about Christ. Your parents can't make it for you. The church can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend can't make it for you. You have to make it yourself. You must make the commitment. One of the popular songs according to Billboard is entitled, Lonely Alone. And how true that is. Lonely Alone. And it's in that part of you. And when you voted, you yourself had to cast your own vote. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. You choose life, that you and your seed may live. It affects future generations. It affects your children and your grandchildren. A decision that my grandfathers made years ago affects my life today. We read that a generation earlier, Moses had chosen Christ. And the writer to the Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. He could have been commander in chief of the armies of Egypt, or he might have been the Pharaoh. All the education, all the wealth of Egypt was his. He turned his back on all of it to suffer with the people of God. He chose God. Who are you choosing? Who are you voting for? choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Oh, yes, there's pleasure in sin for a short time, but it's soon over. The hangover comes, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to be there. Choose Christ, and there'll never be a hangover except joy and peace. That doesn't mean that he'll deliver you from all your troubles and problems and trials because that will go on and on. But they may be different. 
God allows them. That's a part of our maturing process. That's how God trains us. But down deep inside is a deep river of joy and peace in the midst of the life that you're living. Now, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. But Christ can change your past. He died on the cross so that all the sins you've ever committed, all the things you've ever done wrong are forgiven. And when God says they're forgiven, he means more than we mean. He means justification. That means just as if you had never committed any sin at all. That's the power of the blood of Christ that we heard him singing about a while ago. I know my sins are under the blood. And the choice involves a price. The apostle Peter wrote, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the pre precious blood of Christ. The price that Jesus paid on the cross when he shed his life blood for you. Martin Luther once said, the founder of, I suppose, the Reformation and the founder of, we could say, almost one of the founders of Protestantism and certainly of the Lutheran churches. He said, when I look at myself, I don't know how I can be saved, but when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I could be lost. John Calvin, who founded Reformed theology in one sense and the Presbyterian church said, upon a life I did not live, upon a death I did not die, I hang my whole eternity. I hang it on Jesus. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, when he lay dying, said, my mind is almost gone. I can remember only two things. I'm a great sinner, but Jesus is a great Savior. Christ is a great Savior. What do you have to do? You have to repent of your sins. That means to be willing to change your way of living. You may have no power to do it. You may not have power to give up some of those habits you know are wrong. You may not have power to fall in love with your wife again. You may not have power to change your whole life that you know needs to be changed. But if you surrender to Christ, he'll give you the power. You say, well, Billy, I don't know what else to do. I've been baptized, I joined the church and so forth, but I don't really have peace and joy and power in my life, all that you're talking about. How do I get it? If you're not sure that you're ready to meet God, if you're not sure you're going to heaven and you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, you come and make sure tonight. I believe that none of you are here by accident tonight. I believe that you're here on this particular night because this is the night that you are to meet God in a new way and receive him into your heart. And it's an urgent decision because to delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision in itself is a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. If you have a ticket for a flight to Atlanta tonight and can't decide whether to go or not, if you wait past the departure time, the choice will have been made. The plane will take off without you. Decisions are made whether we make them or not. Time decides if you will not. And time always decides against you. Joel said, put you in the har sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now is the accepted time, the Bible says. Come now while you can. You may not have a chance tomorrow. Today is the day to cast your vote totally for Christ. Sir Walter Scott, the most important of three letters in the English language, he said were N-O-W, now. Bartimaeus was a blind man. Jesus was coming through his town, the little town of Jericho. And he was blind and he had that one moment and he cried out and he said, Jesus, have mercy upon me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. And the scripture says that someone told him that it was Jesus, that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. He took that one moment. I believe this whole crusade has been planned and prayed for and organized and we've been brought here maybe just for you. I told people when I came here that I felt we'd come to Tallahassee because of one person. I do not know who that person is, but you may be the person. And it'd be worth all the effort for you because you see, Christ would have died on the cross if there'd been nobody but just you. 
on the rugged, wave-beaten cliffs of the west coast of Scotland, a man was once gathering the eggs of the seabirds which nest there. He'd been let down from the top of the cliff by a rope to the ledge where the nests were. But in a moment of carelessness, he'd let the rope slip from his hand. He knew that the first swing of the rope would be his only chance, and with all the powers of his body and mind, he jumped for the rope. He seized it, and he was saved. The rope is swinging in your direction, the rope of salvation from the cross and the empty tomb. God is saying, seize it. The Bible says there'll come a day when they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. There will come a day. You'll cry out to God, but it'll be too late. Come now. There may never be a thing like this in your lifetime in Tallahassee again, ever, when you're so close to the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask you to do something we've seen several hundred people do in the last two days. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I surrender my heart to Jesus Christ. I want to be sure that I'm ready to meet God. The first day we were here, the wife of a pastor came. People from the choir came. An usher came. And God is speaking to you. You may be the finest Christian in town as far as people think, but deep down inside, you know you're not. You need to surrender to Christ and make him Lord and Savior of your life. Why do I ask you to come forward? Because every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. He died on the cross publicly for you. Now you must come publicly and say yes to him. And I'm going to ask everyone to be in an attitude of prayer as you get up and come. Men, women, young people, to cast your vote tonight and vote for Jesus. You know you need him. We're going to wait on you quickly from up in the top and all around here. God is speaking to you. You come.